It is a huge, extreme honor to be interviewing Stephen Abrams Day. I mean, reading your resume, you should probably get the Nobel Prize in dentistry. You have. You are just – and my friends – and you, you, you practice in Toronto, right? That's right. And my, my friends in Toronto, I mean, they, they can't say enough good things about you as a person, as a human, as a humanitarian, as a scientist, as a researcher. I mean, you've had your fingers in more – things in dentistry from water fluoridation to you're the founder of the canary system to i mean i mean you're just an amazing amazing person um thanks for thanks for giving me an hour of your time today oh it's my pleasure you've done some very interesting things as well too so i wouldn't sort of undersell yourself devil well, towns is a very neat place for dentists to share ideas and that's really important in a very safe way Yes, well, well, thanks. But all all I've done is made it possible for people to connect with people like you, not me, not not connect with me. But uh, but really, I mean, I mean, you're the things, the awards you've got. I mean, I mean, I, I don't want to read them because it, it it take the whole hour just to read them. But I mean, I I don't think there's anything you haven't done or got an accolade for or whatever. Um, I don't know I, where I want to actually start is since we're both dentists. Is, um. Carries. I mean, I mean, basically, if you're a fireman, you signed up to fight fires, and if you're a policeman, you're catching bad guys. And and we're we're dentists. We we signed up to go after Streptococcus mutans causing cavities and P. gingivalis gum disease. And now we've learned 28 years later, there's more bugs than I, I hear. They're discovering a new bug in the mouth every three months. Uh, they're discovering a new species of bacteria. So so what's new with carries? And 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 furthermore is um. What was the early journey for you to get into the, the canary system? Well, let's start with the early and, and, journey. And, and, I, and I'm not going to spank you on this show for not doing an online CE course on the canary system. I, I've wanted that since – in fact, I think when we started online CE in 1994, yours was the first course I wanted to get on there because uh, – we, we put up like 325 courses, and they've been viewed over half a million times. And you're going to have to end this podcast by committing to an online CE course on the canary system because you know so much about canary uh, about uh, caries. And uh, but but how did how did how did your journey start with caries? What 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 has changed about your personal knowledge of of a cavity or of caries uh, back in the early day versus now? And how does the canary system play into all this? Well, my knowledge is basically as yours is. We're both, I graduated 1980 from the University of Toronto, and my training there was extension for prevention. That was the big mantra at that point in time. And I had troubles with that because, you know, if we, once you got to know your patients, really, why did you have to make such extensive restorations to treat very small lesions? And then I became frustrated as time moved on with really the inability to find caries at the appropriate time. And what was most frustrating was pit and fissure caries. How could I treat pit and fissure caries and how could I detect them? And the story behind the canary system is one day in 1998 or one week, I'd had a terrible week. I'd seen three patients in a row. Two, I thought, had pit and fissure caries. There was nothing. And the third one had a large, large lesion. And I realized I'd misdiagnosed in all three. And into my room walks a physicist who's a patient in our clinical practice. I shared with him the story, and he says, I got the solution. I have technology that can image defects in crystal structure. And are you interested? And again, I always end the story by saying I was told two of the biggest lies. It won't cost you any money, and it won't take any of your time. And from 98 to now, <laughs> this is where I am. So the journey has been an interesting one because it's landed me in the arms of a number of very interesting people who are doing primary research in caries and epidemiology and in program design, all of which fit into where my head is at at this point in time. We as dentists really treat diseases, and I keep saying that to government and to patients and to my dental colleagues. We don't fill teeth. We treat disease. And the big diseases that we treat are caries, periodontal disease. We treat parafunction. We treat diseases because of erosion, because of exposure to acidic environments. And we treat a variety of different orofacial injuries. Those are our diseases. And as soon as we get that messaging out, then patients don't look at us as if we're mechanics. Oh, can you fix this tooth? I'm not fixing that tooth. I'm treating one part of the endpoint of that particular disease process. And that restoration won't treat the disease. 
It treats the effect of the disease. You, the patient, have to work with me and my team to treat the disease. If we don't treat the disease, you'll be back in for more restorative work or whatever we're choosing to do. So it carries as the disease, and that's really, really critical in my head. And, and, and it just seems like the older I get and the more I read, the less I understand. It's far more complex than we realize. I mean, you're not born with that bug. You probably picked it up from your mom when she kissed you. Um, there's so many factors involved. Um, I'm sure hereditary genetics has some effect. Um, you know, it seems to grow wild in some mouths, and, you know, it, it's it's crazy. Um, so so there might be someone listening right now um, early on and saying, what is the canary system? So so explain that so they uh, – it, So the canary, the canary system came about as a means of detecting changes in the crystal structure of the tooth because caries as a disease results in the destruction of the tooth, the crystal structure of the tooth. And what it does is it uses a pulsed laser and they measures the changes in the crystal structure on the surface and beneath the surface. Quite simply, if you drop energy into any object, it wants to get out. So if I put a red laser on and I shut it off, that red laser, if there's no defect in the crystal structure, will just diffuse the tooth and disappear. If there's a small hole, carries crack, defect in a restoration, It'll absorb the laser energy, becomes trapped. As soon as, the, as soon as the laser shut off, it radiates and comes back out. And we measure the reflected heat and what's called luminescence from the tooth. And we convert that into a canary number on a scale of 1 to 100. And depending upon the surface that you're looking at, you can then decide what you need to do in the realm of treatment. And treatment can be something as simple as I'll monitor that to placing a sealant to beginning to put them onto a remineralization program where a brown spot, maybe you can harden those up and measure the changes to the replacement of a restoration. Or what happened to me yesterday in clinical practice, patient came in, diffuse pain, lower right hand side, white wing radiograph, nothing present, cold, all the rest of it, picked up my canary, scanned a small stained um, groove on the marginal ridge, there's a crack. And removed the restoration, there was a big crack but it was early on to the process. And so we placed a bonded restoration with the possibility that it may require endodontics and a crown in the future. But here, this diagnostic was able to help me where others couldn't. So you're saying it's purely a diagnostic instrument? Yeah. <clears throat> and, it is a di yeah. And so um, and what is someone saying? Well, what is the difference between that and a diagnodent? Diagnodent, well, there are, the, there are a number of ways of measuring or trying to measure tooth decay. Diagnodent uses fluorescence or glow, so the laser light is on all the time. And then we say, well, what is glowing? Well, what glows is stain, and bacteria, and restorations. And so diagnodent does measure those things. Does it measure caries? No. Unfortunately, it doesn't measure caries, or if it does, it measures very near surface changes, very, very near surface. Is it is it an over is it an ethical oversimplification for me to tell my patients um, I just convert that that uh, the canary number to the percent of the way that it's to the nerve I you know I, I, I think I get their attention when I say okay right now you have a two hundred and fifty dollar cavity if it grows deeper and hits the nerve it changes over to a twenty five hundred dollar root canal and a crown you can't and you can't afford that because uh, I'm in Phoenix I mean I'm I'm in Phoenix I mean one 20% of my five mile radius does not even speak English. And I'll say, and if you can't afford that $2,500 root canal and a crown, we're back to a $250 extraction. So you pay me $250 now, and you walk out the door with a tooth. You walk out that door and don't fix it. You're going to be back here in a year or two, and then, it, and then you're still going to give me $250, but I'm going to keep the tooth. Is it, is, it too, is, is it unethical for me to show them that number and say that's the percent of the way towards the nerve? It's one of the things that we found is that we use a description that's very simple. We say that <clears throat> the scale is 1 to 100. Anything under 20 is healthy. And then as we scan, the canary has a voice. So you hear the number. And what's amazing is, is that the patients will ask, well, what does the number 40 mean? And we'll say, on that tooth, with your level of risk, 
there is caries there, there's decay. Okay, they say, then how do you treat it? So the discussion is a very different one than showing them an x-ray and showing them a spot on an x-ray. They understand numbers, and what's amazing is, is that they also remember the numbers, so that they'll come back and say, geez, when you're checking that tooth, I remember it was a 50, now it's a 40. So the discussion is, yeah, that's right. What did you do? How did you bring the number down? We also prepare printed reports when we're doing some of our scans, and the patient can leave with a printed report, or they can look at that report on our cloud. So the report records the worst number on that tooth. And again, they then understand numbers because they have their blood work, they have their PSAs, they have all the other things that one would be looking at. And they understand that if we can go up or down the scale, it depends upon what they as patients can do. So we never tell them, oh, if you don't do something now, they say, oh, it's a 40. Doc, what do you think I should do? And the discussion then becomes, a 40 means this, this is where we go. And, you know, <clears throat> I've been, I've been um, trying to tell Dennis my entire career that, you know, that dentistry, you know, you, you make something, sell something, watch the numbers. And all they want to do is learn how to make fillings, crowns, and root canals. But if you don't sell something, I, I tell them, are you really a good dentist? Because the average close rate in dentistry is 38%. And, mm -hmm. and if you, if you <clears throat> focus on selling dentistry more to fight this house on fire, this catch this bad guy, I mean, mm -hmm. how many times have you seen two practices, identical rent, everything's exactly the same. They both have a thousand active charts and one dentist has got an 80% close rate and is doing twice as much revenue as the dentist that's doing um, a 40% close rate. And the bottom line is, <laughs> I don't know how you can be a good call yourself a good fireman if you don't put out six out of every 10 fires in your neighborhood. And I just think a dentist that puts out that can get eight cavities fixed versus four cavities out of 10 fixed is just a better dentist. I mean, I, I think it, 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 a lot of this is about how to sell something and you got to get the patient involved and they got to hear the sound and you got to engage them. And well, that's, that's exactly it. We need to shift because patients are not dumb. And they want to know what's going on. And a lot of them know a lot more than we know, walk, than we think they know walking in. So that they, you know, once you engage them in a discussion where you have a scale to measure disease, you can then begin to tell them that it gets worse or it gets better. And here's how you go ahead and, and treat it. It's, so I don't think of things in my head in terms of close ratio. I think of things in terms of here's the diagnosis. Here are the range of issues we've found in, in your mouth, and here are the things that we're recommending you do. And then you decide what you want to do. Now, and see, inevitably, they say, let's go for it. And to our listeners, the, the reason Stephen can say that his patients are dumb is because he's Canadian and I'm American. So, see, I, I can't say that in America. Uh, you know, I, uh, but no, I'm just teasing. But, um, but, but so I want you to address this. It's 2015. Yep. We landed on the moon, you know, 45 years ago in 1969, and you keep seeing these dentists, they just walk out there with this metal hook, this shepherd hook, and then they go in there, and then they just write down a W, a watch. I mean, really? I mean, why don't you be a pirate? Why don't you wear a pirate's patch with one eye with your little, you know, hook to a stub? I mean, don't you think we've grown past an explorer and a hook and, a, and writing a W in a chart? I mean, really? You're going to just write a watch? When you could digitize this, <clears throat> and you're in, you got digital X-rays, you got CAD CAM, you got 3D X-rays, and you're still just going in with a hook and writing a W, you can quantify that so much better than a hook and a W. I mean, what what do you what do you think? And consultants get consultants have told me something that everybody's aware of and everybody's trying to get their hands around it. But it seems like as the dentist writes more and more watches, they seem to be headed towards more and more depression, disease, uh, dysfunction. Um, because, you know, like if a fireman showed up at, up at a house on fire, he jumps out of the truck and puts water on it. And then a dentist looks at the hygienist and says, yeah, I got a stick on number three. And he just looks at it, takes his little monkey hook, you know, pokes around, says, ah, oh, watch it. And it's like that, that's kind of a sign of low energy, kind of depression. There, there should have been more excitement. There should have been a measurement, discussion, pull up a digital x-ray, get out a canary, the voice. And you, know, you know what I mean? The yep. high energy person, it takes higher energy uh, and karma and goodwill to convince this patient, hey, let's zip this in the butt now. Let's not let this grow into something bigger and more extensive 
And uh, I, I really think every dental office should track their watch rates just so they can confront the doctor saying, and you also see it on doctors who work five and a half days a week. We're all seeing that in the consulting business where it seems like the dentists who go in three days a week have the highest energy because they, they, they're off for four days and rest up. But as the doctor keeps dragging out their schedule longer and longer and longer, they just start slowing down. Yeah, they're going to run a marathon that week, but they're going to crawl it. Uh, where some people just wake up Monday morning and run their whole damn marathon in four hours. So what do you, what do you think of the watch? What, 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 you got 7,000 people, dentists, listening to you right now. What would you say to the dentist who just sits there and does watches, just says, well, we'll just watch it? Well, first thing I would say is we change the word from watch to monitor. Monitor is a different word. Monitor means I recognize there's pathology there. And I'm going to monitor it. Now, you can monitor it using visual, which isn't great. Or you can monitor it using Carrie's detection devices, the Canary being one that I recommend. But watching it is, what are you watching? You're waiting until it blows up. Then in your monitor, you can then say to the patient, there are a number of lesions that I am monitoring that are, you know, are early on. There are white spots visually. Or in our canary world, there are spots where you're seeing numbers in the range of 25 to 30 to 40, depending upon the surface. You then turn to the patient and say, let's see what we can do to harden these lesions. Let's not watch them. Let's monitor them. And let's talk about your home care. So that becomes then providing them with product. You can suggest to them the over-the-counter products that are available. 3M makes a ClinPro toothpaste, ClinPro 5000, which is very good. We've done some work with it for remineralizing early lesions. And that can, that's available through dental practices. That provides them with a high concentration of calcium and phosphate and fluoride, and it'll harden the lesion. So now you have a patient who has a number assigned to a tooth surface and a treatment, and you're monitoring it. And there you are. If you want to go further and say, well, I want to do something in the office, well, then have your dental assistant or dental hygienist apply fluoride varnish, especially in patients at higher risk, application of fluoride varnish quarterly, along with dispensing a home-based therapy, provides you with a good preventive program. And there, you're not watching, you're actively involved, doing the right thing, and you're making sure if you're measuring the lesions, and again, our recommendations with Canary, you're then making sure that the lesions are not getting larger, but they're getting smaller. And you're measuring the changes which are happening beneath the surface, something that you can't see visually. And if it's on smooth surfaces, something you can't see with a radiograph. Go one step further. When I look at an adult or a child, deep pits and fissures. Do I do a preventive resin restoration, place a class one restoration, or place a sealant? Well, what's the fissure like? I don't know. I can only see a little stain. Pick up a device, in this case a canary, place a sealant. Once you know that fissure is free and clear of caries, and you say to the patient, you're at high risk of developing decay in these pits and grooves, would you like a non-invasive solution for treating it? And they say, yeah. Well, here are the numbers. Let's put on the sealant. Then you say, well, I can't tell what's going on beneath it. Well, we have data from our company and some other research that's been done that shows that we can monitor decay between opaque and clear sealants. So you can then place that sealant and scan it on an annual basis to make sure that it's still doing fine. We just released data in July at a CARES conference on look, looking at detecting decay beneath clear resin infiltrants, such as ICON. And one of the challenges with ICON is, where is it and can I see beneath it? Because the surface is clear. Well, with our system, you can do that. So there are a number of modalities you can do to treat lesions that you would traditionally, as I say, watch, but you're not really watching. And the other thing is, let's say you have a patient who has no disease. That's great. In our office, it's celebrated. Look at what you've done. Look at what we've done together. And those patients are wonderful ambassadors because they leave saying, I went to the office, I'm going to see, you know, Dr. Abrams for many years, and I'm healthy. So, yeah, I'm so basically what you said in a nutshell is you got to take that W. If you turn a W upside down, it's an M. we got to go yep. from watch to monitor. Just flip that W upside down, an M. Get a canary system. I highly recommend it. How much is a canary system? Right now, the canary system is available. The list price is uh, 13995 
And there are convention specials available at each of the conventions. And they and they would find that at the canarysystem.com. That's correct. And and so everybody, so the canary, I assume, I've always assumed, um, a canary in a coal mine, the song with the police, that they would take a canary down the coal mine, and when yep. gas would start coming out, the little birdie would die first, and they could see the bright yellow canary in a coal mine. And when That's the right. yellow, little, yellow canary died, everybody ran out of the mine. Is that where the name came from? That's where the name came from. So were you? Uh, were you? Uh, was that after you saw the movie The Coal Miner's Daughter, or what? 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 Uh, or was it the Police Song? Wh- which one introduced you to uh, the Canary in a Coal Mine? The story was we had hired a marketing firm before we launched our product a number of years ago at a research meeting, and we were all researchers at that point in time. And they came in and said, "Here's what we're calling your product," and we said. Oh, you know, we want to call it PTR Loom. We want to go. They said, no, this is it. I said, do we have another choice? He said, no, it's called the Canary. <laughs> that was it. Oh. It's just stuck. I really like it. But I wasn't thinking about that. Okay, you, you've you opened up a, a, a big can of worms because I, I know I know my dentist because I've, I've watched him talk on Dental Town at least four hours a day, seven days a week since 1998. And, man, when you say the word sealants, the claws come out because half of the dentists out there think sealants are – they work, they're viable, and they use them. And mm-hmm. the other half can show you a ton of PDFs that say that, you know – Half of sealants fail in year one, the other half fail in year two. And if you think a sealant lasts longer than two years, uh, you just don't have any research to stand on. So uh, address that. There was a conference, uh, a pre-conference at the European Organization for Caries Research a couple weeks ago in Brussels that I attended. And this was one of the discussions that went on. There's some very good data that a number of the Danish and Swedish researchers have shown that over a 10-year period, sealants do stay in place. But they also suggest that you monitor them very carefully because they can be lost. But they do feel, and uh, Dr. Fitz is very, very clear in her work, that they will stay and they do actually prevent caries or prevent the lesions from growing. So she, she says, select your, your patients properly. And when she and I have spoken privately, it's also been make sure that the fissures are relatively clean. And that's what the canary can do for you. You've got to place the sealants in the fissure. How, how can the, uh, the canary is a diagnostic device. How can it clean yeah. the pit and fissures? Well, no, make sure your pits and fissures are clean. It's a diagnostic device. You may want to use air abrasion or the fissure, the fissure may be clean enough once you've used a flowable etch to get into that, that area. You've got to make sure, too, that you keep the area very isolated so that you don't get any moisture in the area. But her work and the work that was presented at this meeting really brought me to think again about using sealants in my adult population in order to to try and prevent caries, especially in some of the young adults who are under the age of 30 where there are deep pits and fissures, but where the decay rates are very, very low. And decay rates um, um, are, are – I still can't believe the United States subsidizes corn farmers to make high fructose corn syrup, and I still have witnessed at least every six months someone standing – at McDonald's or Circle K or 7-Eleven or whatever, and two young kids in front of you, you know, one will order a, uh, a bottle of water, and the kid next to him will say, well, the 64-ounce Thirst Buster is cheaper. And it's like, how can a bottled water be 99 cents and the big old 64-ounce Dilla Coke 69 cents? How, how, how can we have a society like that? And, and then that's why you would have to do sealants on adults because – I, I, what I've heard is that last year was the first year that America drank more calories than it ate. It consumed 51% of its calories in liquid, and, yep. and it just doesn't and, – and plus, also, you're in Canada where uh, – I'm in the desert where it's 117 today, so people drink a lot more fluids. Mm-hmm. And we even saw that in the water fluoridation research where you, know, you need a lot less fluoride in the water in something like the desert than you do up in uh, – northern areas where they don't consume as much water you you and then i you also mentioned you said the word fluoride varnish um a lot of pediatric dentists on dental town talk about that that is one of the most underused technologies out there and there and, and nobody can figure out why do so many people not in love and use judiciously fluoride varnish talk about fluoride varnish well, I, it's one of the problems is is that we as clinicians are trained the fact that fluoride gels are an, a good way of applying fluoride in a, in your patient population. But fluoride varnish provides you with a very 
high concentration of fluoride that when you apply it and you let it alone for about an hour and a bit, you'll absorb it into this outer surface of the tooth and it will provide the protection that fluoride gives you. There's a lot of research coming out now that begins to question the value of topical fluoride foams and gels. In my opinion, there's still a role for topical fluoride foams and gel, but there needs to be more and more use of fluoride varnish in your patient population. In my clinical practice, for example, if I'm seeing a patient for restorative dentistry and I'm having to see them for two or three lesions at the end of the appointment, I'll turn to them and say, today's gift is fluoride varnish and it's the best gift you'll ever get from me. And that becomes, it's applied then and we'll apply it out of the recare visits as well too in order to increase the fluoride content, especially in the areas where I'm placing the restorations. And don't you think that the fluoride varnish is sticky? I mean, when we talk about sugars, I mean, there's a difference between a liquid sugar mm -hmm. and like a, a sticky honey or, or a raisin or something. So don't, don't you think the stickiness um, has to really change the outcome since it's sticking to the uh, tooth? It is, it is sticky, and a lot of the manufacturers have been moving towards varnishes that don't feel uh, don't have that tactile feel to them as the older ones done and i would encourage you to look at the varnishes that are on market we're a big proponent of the 3m uh, vanish varnish it's got a good flavor to it so we don't get any pushback from patients so i don't like the taste of it or taste too bitter and we don't get that tactile feel oh my tongue gets really upset when you you know they don't i don't get that feedback from them and it's an easy varnish to apply so that Varnishes are different today than they were a number of years ago, but they do provide a high concentration of fluoride, and they are good for patients, especially those where you're having to do restorative dentistry. So the over-the-counter toothpaste are basically a thousand part per million mm -hmm. uh, fluoride. The, the ClinPro is five thousand part per million. What's yeah. the uh, what's the what did you say the 3M name was? 3M what? It's, it's ClinPro five thousand. It's, it's uh, a toothpaste, I, but what's the name of their varnish? Varnish is vanish. Vanish. Okay, and yeah. is that also five thousand part per million, or? I think it's a bit higher. I don't have the number off the top of my head. It's, it's a much bit higher. higher. You know, yeah. I I always think of you um, as the leader in uh, public health dentistry or preventative dentistry. You know, some some dentists are out there. You know, just they master drilling, filling, and billing faster and easier. Uh, but you, it seems like you've spent your whole career trying to actually prevent disease. I mean, you, you're you're the fireman that's out there putting sprinklers in everyone's home. Uh, not trying to get the big, biggest water truck out there. Um, you, you just, um, um, you're also big into water fluoridation. Have any of your views changed in water fluoridation over the last 30 years on preventing? No. One of the things that I did, which was really a lot of fun to do, was a couple of years ago when water fluoridation was becoming a heightened concern in, in my area of Canada, is I approached a number of my research colleagues and said, you know what, it's time for you as researchers to revisit the research on fluoride. Why don't we hold a symposium at the International Association for Dental Research meeting and revisit the research, revisit how to apply it, and then I think go out and tell the dental community, look at we've taken a look at it. And so I gathered together uh, Jay Kumar, Angelis Martinez-Meyer, Barb Gooch, and Gary Slade, and it was fabulous experience for me. And they looked at water fluoridation, its safety, its effectiveness, and how to use it within the community. And the end result of that particular symposium was, yeah, it works. A lot of the things that we're hearing from the anti-fluoridations uh, don't make any sense at all. Angelus Martinez-Meyer, who's at the U University of Indiana, has been doing some very interesting studies looking at tissue samples and tying them between fluoridated and non-fluoridated communities. And her work that she presented, and I just spoke to her a couple of weeks ago, there's no time for all the claims that we're hearing from the anti-fluoridationists. And so for me, doing this had a number of reasons. One, it helped to validate my comfort level with community water fluoridation. And we're now looking to get, we're just waiting now to get this published in one of the journals. But the outcome at the meeting was, it makes sense. And it's very good to use. You know, it, it's, um, it's silly um, that... Um in the United States, only 70% of the towns use it and 30% don't. And I want to ask you for help on that because on Dentaltown, one of our 51 sections, one of them is community water fluoridation. And so on any given day, there's a bunch of poor individual dentists 
have to go talk to the city council or to their mayor or whatever, whatever. And they just don't, they, they just haven't spent their whole life on top of this. Like, like the people you're mentioning, I, I hope you could, uh, deliver some of those names to me, uh, to do a podcast. I would like to in the water, uh, community water fluoridation. They, they are fabulous. I tell my patients, could you imagine your favorite topic in the whole wide world? And they say, I said, mine was water fluoridation and you get the experts to sit in a room with you and they talk to you and then you go out for lunch and they talk to you more. And that was what the experience was. Here are these four very bright individuals who have various areas of expertise. And my job was to bring them together and to translate the research into language we as clinicians could understand, but it was a really wonderful experience. And it validated it. Our big challenge now is how to take this information and move it to the community. And that's really, we have to look to the ADA and the Center for Disease Control in the United States who do have very good toolkits for them. And here in Canada, this uh, CDA, the Canadian Dental Association, and the Ontario Dental Association, along with the both in Canada and the United States, the public health dental sections, to help us get the message out. Because the message is the same from community to community. It, it really is. And it's just a matter of how do we train the, the people to deliver the message properly. Well, if you did you film any of those uh, meetings? They were filmed. Um, the uh, IADR has the rights to the films, and you can see them on their website if you are an IADR member. So we've gotten summaries done, and we're just waiting for publication now in uh, Journal Canadian Dental Association. Well, tell them if they want to put any of those on uh, on Dentaltown. Um, you know, we'd love it. Or, or if you want to email me at Howard at Dentaltown dot com and CC anybody to do a podcast on water fluoridation, uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, interview them on that because it's um, the the last time I just um, debate. I did it in '89, worked on that in Phoenix, and then we had to do it again just a couple of years ago, and. You know, now that I'm 53 and I did this 20 years later, I'm absolutely convinced that at least 20% of all Americans are completely batshit crazy. I mean, the conspiracies and, 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 and listening to them, um, like when you say Centers for Disease Control, oh, government, government, you know, I mean, they, they just they just don't have any trust for the government. And when you come to them and I say, so you think 15,000 people work at the Centers for Disease Control and they're all in a conspiracy for the government against you? You don't think these people have dedicated their lives to help you have less disease? And they, they, they say no. I mean, they literally think if when you say the word government, they grab their shotgun, their NRA membership, and they just stop believing you. And then they would look at me in the eyes and say, well, you you want this because you're a dentist and it's going to weaken the teeth so you'll make more money. And it's like, are you kidding me? I mean, they really, they seriously really believe that. And and I believe 20% uh, of Americans have 0.0, .0 trust for the government. And when the government shows up and says, I'm here to help, they, ju they just run. I'm going to tell you from a, this is a Canadian perspective. When I tell my patients, one of the things that the U.S. government should be extremely proud of is the, the tool that you have called PubMed. The National Institute for Health has taken it upon itself to gather literature from any peer-reviewed journal, and it's available to anybody, anybody. Log on to PubMed.com, type in five keywords, and you get the latest research. That's not offered by any of the other countries in the world. The U.S. government has taken it on, and it's a fabulous website, and it becomes the entrance for anybody doing research. And you, and I've said to them occasionally, who do you think put that up there? And how much do you pay to access it? You, you pay nothing to access it. And the U.S. government is the one that established PubMed. It's an amazing tool. If this was a government that wasn't interested in, in providing evidence base to anybody, they'd never put the tool up. I actually um, saved... Um I, I think um, I'm at 5,000. Uh, I, I, the, the, the main use I use for that is water, community water fluoridation, but I, yep. I think I've read 5,000 um, citations on water fluoridation in the last but 20 you've years. Never paid, you've never paid yeah. a for it. Yeah, I know. And who's, who, who's you, not me, you as a U.S. taxpayer are paying for that. And when you take a look at the research community and they want to do, let's do a meta-analysis on implants – and the first thing they do is go to PubMed. Let's do a meta-analysis on zirconia crowns. Do PubMed. 
This is a fabulous tool. If the U.S. government had a secondary agenda, they wouldn't have put that up. So, I mean, I'm taking us way off. off no, 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 no. It, 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 this just sums up you. I mean, in 1992, you got a Canada's uh, Commemorative Medal for Community Service. In 2002, the Barnabas Day Award from the Ontario Dental Association for 20 years of distinguished service. In 2014, you were awarded the Alpha Omega Humanitarian Award for your work on behalf of the dental profession. I mean, I mean, th this has been your whole career. I mean, you, you're, you're seriously a public health legend in dentistry. I like dentistry. It's, it's a wonderful, it's been a wonderful part of my life. Really so I, so I want you, I want you to, I, so I, I'm going to, based on all your humanitarian awards and, and like say, um, um, everybody I know that knows you just thinks you're just a bum. I, I want you to, there's nine specialties recognized by the American Dental Association. Yeah. And I think a lot of dentists forget that one of those specialties is public health dentistry and that inv and we're all in public health dentistry and we all are in um, – we all should be in the schools talking about um, uh, preventative dentistry during uh, February's Children's Health Month, yep. um, working to get our water supplies, uh, community water fluoridation. Um, I think I, – I don't want to touch politics, sex, religion, or violence because you can't go there, but – I mean, really, why don't 150,000 dentists ask the government to stop subsidizing corn farmers to make high fructose corn syrup when dental decay, obesity, and diabetes are exploding and it's cheaper to buy sugar now than it was before they started subsidizing all this stuff? I mean, it's just crazy, but, but, but give, give a lesson to these uh, dentists out there about why – they shouldn't just be taking all these courses in bone grafting and implants and root canals and why they should um, – it's their, their duty and their call of honor that dentistry is not an occupation for money. It's a vocation. I mean my, my two older sisters that are nuns, they, ne they never got paid money to be a Catholic nun. They're just they're, – it's a vocation. I, I've always thought dentistry was the vocation. Do you, do you think it's an occupation or a vocation? And do you think all dentists are really public health dentists? Well, I think that we're all public health dentists because we're all interested in our practice, and our practice is a, is a small community. And in my travels and talking to dentists, the sense that I have is that we want to do the right thing. And doing the right thing doesn't mean doing it for free. I don't think that that should be an expectation of us, of, of, for, for us, but doing the right thing means reaching out to the public to make them understand what the value is of the things that we do, how valuable is preventive dentistry and how valuable is implant dentistry and how valuable is endodontics or any of the other things we do. The most important and valuable thing that we can do is set up a dental home where our patients and their families can come in and access services at one point of contact with the dentist being the quarterback. And then from there, we can then decide which of the services you require. That's really my vision. And where government fits into this is government should be funding the dental home. And what we should be doing with government is working to get the population to access oral health care. So if we look at publicly funded dental programs in Canada and the United States, the access is poor, even if it is free for the people receiving it. Why is it? Why is an oral health care valuable? And why aren't providers compensated properly? And why don't we have dental homes where people feel comfortable? You don't go to a clinic for poor medicine, for, you know, poor people don't have a clinic for medicine because they're poor. You access private practitioners, community health clinics, but they're there to engage you. And we as dentists can then, during oral health month or during the year, go out and engage the population and talk to them about the value of oral health care. And that then will take apart the fructose boys or the corn syrup guys, because as soon as you get patients and people to value oral health, they'll then begin to see that oral health impacts upon nutrition, it impacts upon employability, it impacts upon all sorts of things. It's a valuable, valuable component of, of, of living. And that's found in a dental home, and a dental home is resides in a practice or in community health clinics where dentists are there as quarterbacks. And that's my vision. You sound like Winston Churchill after World War II, where he said, we're going to take all this war money and put it in health care and education because the country with, with uneducated, sick people it has no future. 
Yep. And by the way, when I listen to you, I, I, I think you must have a twin. I, I don't know who's more eloquent and poetic about public health, you or Jack Dellenberg. Do you, you know Jack Dellenberg, the dean of the Arizona Dental School in Arizona? No. No. Um, he, uh, you two uh, could be uh, twins raised apart since birth. Uh, he, he he talks as eloquently about um, the big macro, big picture of uh, public health dentistry like you do. So, Oaks, I want you to address this question. Um, we just had 5,000 graduates walk out of school in May. And they're the biggest consumer of my podcast. Those young kids, they, they have their iPhone. They Bluetooth it into their car stereo. I don't even know how to do it. I can't even listen to my own podcast in my Lexus because I'm not smart enough at 53. But um, they're, they're – um, so they're going to – I know what they're thinking. They're saying, well, you know, I graduated 250,000 student loans, so I don't have 1400 bucks for a canary system. But, you know, someday uh, I, I want to put that on my list to buy. What would you tell that kid? Two hundred fifty thousand dollars student loans owed them practice. A why they should invest money in the canary. Well, first off, I'm going to tell the kid, which is when we started in clinical practice many years ago. We also came out with student debt and buying practice and building from the ground up was difficult. So the first thing we say is the most important person in your clinical practice is the patient. It's the most important person. The second most important person in that practice is the patient's family. And if you establish those relationships, I look back in my practice now and I'm blessed. So I have three and four generations coming in. And it's really kind of neat because I'm seeing kids getting married and, have, and now it's grandkids. And I've known these families for 35 years. So has it been good for me economically? Well, I don't think about that when I look back on it. Yes, it has. Did I sell them everything they needed to get sold the day they walked in? No. I treated them, we set up a treatment plan, we set goals. I didn't have canary in the beginning, I do now. And we were able to engage them in their oral health care and they're comfortable and they come in. Sometimes they don't follow what we recommend and sometimes they disappear off the face of the earth for a couple of years and come back sheepishly and we welcome them with open arms and begin to take care of them again. So if you would take that approach, then you're using technology to provide optimal care. And in my opinion, Canary provides the optimal diagnostics for doing caries detection and caries management. So why should I buy it? Because I want to do the right thing. I want to find caries, I want to measure caries, and I want to provide a modality of treatment. Why should I do other stuff? Because I want to do the right thing. And then why do I go out and buy it? Because I then go and look at the research behind that particular technology. What is it measuring? How does it measure? Is it repeatable? Are there studies? Are there good studies? And so, you know, we did the same thing. We went out and put digital radiography into our dental practice. We did the same thing for composites, the same thing for implants. It's, it's learning all about them and finding the right way of doing things. But it's the patient and the family that are most important. So, in your, you know, you, you've you've had a, a macro view of the, I mean, you've had a world view of dentistry for 35 years. What do you, what what, how do you think dentistry changed from 35 years ago to today? And looking at the changes, I mean, you hear things about, you know, some people complain about corporate dentistry, but I, but um, but then other people like myself will say, well, yeah, well, dentistry was kind of tough during World War II, World War One, and the Civil War too. I mean, we we all have our our mm -hmm. issues, but. How do you think dentistry has changed in the last 35 years? And talking specifically to these new graduates, what does their future look like for the next 35 years? Do you think um, the profession is going uh, going good and strong? Do you think it's coming into headwinds that are going to destroy it? What, what are your thoughts? Well, the profession, well, first off, off where does the profession come from 35 years ago to today? A number of things have happened. The first off is what we call evidence-based care, which is something that showed up around 1985, 86. And the next thing is the internet and the use of the internet by patients in order to understand the care that we're providing. And the third thing is this whole emphasis on looking at management of disease, which is what the third party carriers are talking about, which is what the dental schools are starting to treat and which we need to get involved in as well. Now, what's the profession going to look like 10 years from now? Our profession needs to step back and become the quarterback. There really isn't a need for a dental therapist to provide care in a practice unless it's under the direct supervision of a dentist. There isn't need to fragment off dental care so that you have independently practicing dental hygienists. 
you need to have one comprehensive look-see at what the needs of that patient and the family are. And that's what we should be doing. So that when you see a family and you see the kids and you see the mom in your waiting room, you begin to understand what their needs are and you can address those needs. Just not how many fillings the kid needs, but why does the kid need the fillings? You know, why is mom drinking pop out in your waiting room with the kids? I know. In my office, it's Mountain Dew and Funyuns. Yeah, but like, you know, really? They, they're, I'll share with you a story. You know, I always like to go out into my reception area to see patients because the first thing that we do is I watch the way they are dressed and watch how they look and how they walk. I was taking care of this really nice old old elderly gentleman in his late 70s, early 80s. And he came in, it was wintertime, said I slipped and fell on the ice. And I looked at his pants and I realized he hadn't been able to get food into his mouth. The pants and the, you know his belly were covered with food stains. And I said, so how did you fall? He said, I fell on the ice yesterday and I broke my front tooth. And I said to him, okay, show me your hands. He lifts up their hands, there's no bruise them at all. And I said, you've had a TIA. He said, no, I haven't. And you looked at his pants and you realized there's something going on. I said, I'll restore the rest, I'll restore the tooth, right? Because that's the fix it part of me. And then you're off to your physician. What did he find in his physician? He had a TIA. So what was my role? My role was to look at the entire human being, treat the areas that were that I could treat, but also diagnose what, when, where, and why. You know, it's interesting. You know, growing up in Kansas, I, I, I was born and raised in Kansas. But when I got out of dental school in Kansas City, I went to Phoenix, Phoenix which is uh, about 100 miles from the Mexico border. Mm-hmm. And uh, you said something interesting to me. You said, you know, the first priority is your patient, and the second priority is your family. And I love the Latinos and the Mexicans and the whole Latin America the most because um, when a um, Latino child comes in, they might bring with them five, six, seven people in the waiting room. I mean, it's a family event. And to me, it's just so romantic. I mean, and then, and then a lot of the non-Latinos will drop a kid off. And then they'll go run errands and go to the grocery store and pick up their dry cleaning and all this stuff. But uh, it, um, it really is a, a family affair in dentistry. I mean, you're not – and during this last 2008 recession, a lot of dentists are asking me, well, where are you getting all your new patients? And I said, from all my old patients having babies and kids. And, I mean, it really is a family affair. So I want you to give a father-daughter talk. Um, let, let's say your daughter just graduated from dental school, and she's driving to work right now. And she's uh, um, driving to work right now. What, 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 you know, since you've done this three and a half decades, what advice would you give her to her future? And, 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 and then playing that, what, what if she um, is conf- uh, doesn't necessarily feel right because she's working for a corporate chain, which I don't really see why when I got out of school, it was really great experience to go work for the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. Someone said, oh, I'm going to go do, I'm going to go work in the military four years, get some experience. And now some of these kids, they'll, they'll go work at corporate dentistry. And they're like, well, is that bad? And I'm like, well, it, it's experience. But she's driving to work right now. She works at a corporate chain. She doesn't like the way they do things. She'd like to have her own place. What, what advice would you give her? To How can she, I mean, I doubt she's ever going to get um, all these awards that you got someday. I mean, I mean, God, you got honorary fellowships at the Pierre Fichard, a Academy of Dentistry International, American College of Dentists, International College of Dentists. Um, um, so let's not shoot that high. But but what, what what advice would you give her? Well, first off, in reality, I do have a daughter, and she wants nothing whatsoever to do with dentistry. <laughs> <laughs> she has come to all the – in the summertime, she comes with us to a lot of these uh, carries conventions and knows a number of the researchers. And I keep saying to her, you know, so what would advice would I give to her if she suddenly changed her mind and decided to become a dentist and ended up in, in a situation she wasn't comfortable in is build the practice you want. If you build the practice you want, either within the confines of another practice or on your own, they will come. Because patients, people are looking for clinicians that want to take care of them, not their teeth, but them. If you think about it, who does a patient see more in healthcare, the physician or the dentist? It's the dentist. And if the dentist is the primary touch point, then you have a chance to begin to look at other issues that these patients bring in. They'll talk to you. We spend five minutes at the end of a visit just getting caught up. How are things doing? How are the kids? Where are things at? And if things are going sour, we talk. 
and I always phrase it as, as a friend of friend because I'm not, you know, I'm not trained in psychology, but then it allows me to push them to see X, Y, or Z. But we're looking at the whole individual. And if you do that, you'll build a practice because people will then feel that you care about them and you honestly do. With with all of your um with all your research background and all this stuff, um, I still get young kids asking me all the time, uh, do you think they'll ever vaccinate decay? You know, we um mm-hmm. you know, they, they we vaccinate mumps, measles, I mean what is there? Nine vaccinations we give a kid before mm-hmm. they're two. What 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 would you say to a young dentist who said Am I, you know, I'm two hundred fifty thousand dollars in debt. Are they, are they going to vaccinate decay? You know, according to the last discussion we had a couple weeks ago, no. The problem is, is it's a very, very, very broad biofilm that lives in your mouth. There's a huge number of bacteria, and if you wipe out two of them, others will show to the fore. So our approach, my approach, has always been to say they exist. How do I control them, and how do I control what they do to teeth and to other oral tissues? And you don't need to vaccinate them if you can get your patients to do adequate home care. You don't need to vaccinate if you want your diet. You won't. So do you see where I'm going? Yes. Instead of wiping out a whole pile of bugs and finding new ones come up, there are ways that we've been able to control caries. But what, what are you saying to the pregnant woman in your chair when you're sitting there looking at that that baby inside her tummy and you're realizing that when that baby's born it's not going to have streptococcus mutans it's not going to have p gingival it's just not going to have the human papillovirus it's not going to have any of those bugs in the mouth just like at the other end it's not going to be born with syphilis gonorrhea aids herpes whatever do you think do you think it's just like um um trying to clean up the ocean by taking one floating piece of trash out? do you think there's any chance that someday we will not pass this on to our children. We will not kiss them on the mouth. They will. It'll be almost like an STD to where the kid will can just like you plan to go your whole life without catching HIV. Um, do you think someday it's reasonable in 10, 20, 100 years that a child will be born and never get contact with streptococcus mutans or PGGLs or HPV? No, I think they're going to get it, but I think that the the one thing that we don't understand yet is how aggressive. Is it? Are there differing forms of it? And, and yeah, it's all right to kiss your kid, but it's also good to have really good oral health before you kiss your kid. If you have really good oral health, you may, you may not be passing on the most aggressive forms of it. And again, this was a debate a couple of weeks ago at a pre-conference meeting about transmissibility. Is it transmissible? Should we be messaging it this way? My opinion is, is that it's a good idea. You just got to kiss your kid. Just make sure you got a good, clean mouth. Make sure your oral health is in good shape. And so now you're talking loading dose because we know with like a water um, poisoning, I mean like a um, diarrhea from cholera, they now yeah. think that you need to swallow 100,000 cholera to actually have a successful yeah. uh, yeah. diarrhea infection. So, so what you're talking about is not only loading dose for kissing your kid, but also you're saying that in, in bigger colonies there's more aggressive forms yeah. of these bacteria. Yeah. That's right. So one of the things that we are, I always talk to government about is that if you're going to design a dental program to treat kids, you should treat mom and dad too. Because mom and dad's going to pass this on. So how do you treat mom and dad? You know, look at the type of preventive measures you have to do. Look at engaging them and actually taking care of their dentition, taking care of their oral tissues on a, on a daily basis. I, I want to. I want to. Since I got a research junkie on my uh, on my show, I want to ask you the most controversial question in all of dentistry. You have on Dental Town two hundred and two thousand registered dentists who have posted four million times. And if you want to say the controversial, craziest thing in the world, a bunch of them, maybe uh, a third, will say these amalgams. The research shows them lasting thirty eight years. They're made out of metal. The ingredients. Mercury, silver, zinc, copper, tin, they're all ba- um, antibacterial, bacterial static. And ours last, um, our studies on our amalgams, the worst studies showing them lasting 14 years. And you composite freaks over here are using inert plastic, and there's not antibacterial, there's no antibacterial properties to them. They're plastic, and your best research is showing that posterior two-service composites are that lasting seven years. So... You, you, you tooth-colored freaks, bacterial static, seven years max, and you're always dogging on our amalgams. 
and and our worst research shows 14 years, and we can show you papers showing our stuff lasts 38 years. So now I'm going to throw you into that uh, under the bus. So, is, I'm telling you, if everybody listens to this, they're going to love you or hate your response. You can't win. You, there's nothing you can say uh, to win over uh, all the viewers with your whatever comes out of your mouth. Well, it's interesting because we have this debate in clinic as well, too, with the, the other guys that I work with, the others, the other, uh, it should be guys, the other guys and gals I work with. In terms of materials, I think that amalgam has its – amalgam, yes, does last longer. It's not pretty. Um, it's much more difficult to monitor its marginal integrity. Um, composites, I think, need to be improved. The one positive over composite, of composites over amalgam is initially they've got very good early bond strength to tooth structure. Over time, I think we need to study how that bond strength deteriorates. There is work being done out there on composites um, that are nanoparticles better filled that release fluoride, such as some of the, the glass ionomers, and there are others that are other things that I've been listening to confidentially, which are really, really neat and coming will be coming for the next couple of years that are improved, that do have the properties of good bond strength, that do release uh, antibacterial, antimicrobial, and fluoride as well too, but they're still well away from market. Those are the ideal materials. Is composite better than amalgam? Well, you know, I, your observation is the same as mine. Those 38-year-old, those 35-year-old amalgams are still hanging around in good, healthy mouths. Once the changes, you add, uh, you know, parafunctional activities, they don't do that well. And, you know, in my mouth, I um, I have seven restorations that are all gold because when, ever since I got out of school in 1987, the only dentistry that I ever saw that was 50-year-old dentistry back in 87 years old was the gold work. I mean, I would see gold foils where my eye could see the gaps in them, but as something about that gold was bacterial static because it just seems like bugs just didn't want to live there. You'd see some of the great, some of the gapping uh, gold foil class fives, and they all worked. I mean, not all, all work, but I mean, they, they yeah. just last longer. So, so do you do you think there's something? Uh, CapTech said it too. They they when they came out with CapTech, they said, well, our porcelain to that high energy gold, that that high energy mm -hmm. is not an environment for Streptococcus mutans. Uh, doesn't want to live there as much. Um, do you, do you think gold um, has an, uh, bacterial static properties by its nature of its high surface energy? May have better marginal adaption. That's what I'm thinking. Maybe you think it's the marginal adaption, not the high service energy? But step back for a second. Look at what we're doing. Look at where we're placing materials. If you look at the environment, we're taking a material and we're sticking it in water for 30 years. And the water gets warmed up. It gets cooled down. And we, ha we can then grind on it. We put a lot of force on it, depending on where it is. It's an acidic environment. And we're expecting this material to live. And then I go back to my research colleagues and say, how do you simulate that in the lab? How do you simulate right, the right. lab? <laughs> you know, and it's like, I don't know. We actually, it's really interesting. One of my colleagues, um, there are a couple of them. There are a couple of artificial mouths that are being used, and we've used those to simulate early lesions. We work with Ben Amici at the University of Texas in San Antonio, and he has an artificial mouth that he's built with teeth, with plaque, with saliva, he feeds, he brushes, and all the rest of that stuff. And that's getting close for us to simulate demineralization and remineralization. But for materials, how are they being tested? As soon as you put a material in water for 30 years and expect it to stand up, that's a really tough environment, no matter what you're using. And then all those other things on top of it. That's why I say to my patients, the best material is enamel. Very well, a fantastic words. So I'm out of um, time. I, I want to ask you a couple of things. Um, I've done. Uh, I think uh, Ryan. What number is he going to be? One. Right. We've released one thirty. But what number is this? I think you're number one fifty three. And um, I would love. You're so connected. If you have other smart people like you in these worlds. Uh, um, you know, send send them my way. I I just think your your mind is amazing. Also, my viewers want to know now: um, can they ever expect to see an online C course from you on the Canary system? So we'll, we'll get we'll we'll get together and get that going. I apologize. We're a young biotech, and, and I get torn and, in every different direction. 
And, well, I, I think the, where it would be great also for the, the dentist listening to this on our way to work is uh, to be able to play this at a uh, – the reason we do one-hour times mm -hmm. um, is because it's a perfect staff meeting, and you could – you know, the, the dentist could watch this, and the hygienist, the assistant, everybody could get on board. Um, um, Bill Rossi calls it equilibrating the practice when you all learn together and you all get on the same page. But uh, um, thank you for a wonderful hour. And you got to share with us, uh, living in Canada, um, what, what is your funniest American joke? <laughs> not going there. You're, you're not going there. I'm oh, not going oh, there, no. My gosh, I always, uh, I always view Canada as the, uh, you know, when you walk into a. Uh, uh, a condo and they got the loft upstairs. Yeah. I always see that the, the uh, can is the loft upstairs uh, uh, where, where the uh, smart people are looking down at us and saying, what a crazy circus you live above. Uh, you probably, you probably walk out your door every day and ask the uh, crazy Americans to keep it down. But thank you for an amazing hour and thank you on an amazing journey. Thank you for uh, all your humanitarian awards, your community service awards, your, your legend in dentistry. And I hope, um, everybody listens to this. I think I think every dentist needs to hear more from you. Thank you very much. I had a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to talk to you. It really was. And and we and you said something uh, that another guest already said. The an endodontist said the best filling material for a tooth is a pulp, and the best dentistry is preventive dentistry, and that's what I associate you with. So thank you for all you've done for preventing disease instead of just drilling, filling, and billing. So have a rocking hot day up there in Canada. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye.